Fast Forward Productions, the women are speaking. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the One Broke Actress Podcast, an honest account of actor life plus a few lessons I learn in the process. I am your host, Sam Valentine, and today we have a very special, not one, but two, casting director episode. I have on Erica Bream and Kara Shoot Rosenbaum. Erica Bream is a casting director in the Southeast market, and Kara Shoot Rosenbaum is a casting director in the LA market. They have connected and they do several online courses together for actors, including the script analysis course. Course that I just finished. If you saw my Instagram, I was inundated with the work and really into what I learned in the process. In fact, I have kind of congealed my own template of their method so that I can try and utilize it in auditions coming up and also in some practice work. And I was so impressed with what they built that I said, please, please, please come on my podcast and talk about this. So they are here today to talk about that and to talk about the realities of actors auditioning into the future, what we're looking ahead to and how we can kind of take stock of where we've been this year, even though a lot of us feel like we haven't auditioned at all. They talk a lot about what you bring to a role versus how you look in a role, which you know is a very important topic to me, and just generally give us a vibe of what we should be looking for in our scripts and sides and why it applies to more than just the bigger roles. So yes, we hit on a lot of information with co-stars today. So this is going to be a podcast you want to listen to more than once. You should absolutely follow them on social media. If you don't, they give away so much good content and their classes are phenomenal. So check those out too. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I hope you're moving into the holidays with some sort of ease. And without further ado, please enjoy Kara Shoot Rosenbaum and Erica Breen. So kind as to introduce yourselves and where you are currently. Give me a little slate so then we can recognize your voices while we're listening to the podcast. I am Kara Shute Rosenbaum. I am a casting director in Los Angeles, California. And I am Erica Bream, and I am a casting director in the Southeast region. And you guys are very prominent in the actor Zeitgeist. So I'm sure everyone already <laughs> knows who you are. I would be shocked if they didn't. But, and Erica, you've for better, podcast for before. For better or for worse. Yeah, I know. You can't hide from the <laughs> internet. It's so fun. You know, I really wanted to have you guys on because I finished your script analysis class and it was so useful and so helpful. And I had so many people ask me so many questions. So instead of starting with the, how did you get into this business? Blah, blah, blah. Can we kick it off with the straight up, what am I talking about that is script analysis? <laughs> Why is it important? It's become such a staple of something that you guys teach? And why is that? It's because it's the most overlooked tool that actors really need to rely on to nail their auditions. I think when you don't have a ton of time, which of course is the life of any audition process, the script analysis almost goes out the window. You kind of just rely on your standard text breakdown or you read it through quickly like, yeah, okay, I get what's going on here. I understand. And that's kind of it because then you're focused on your lighting and your tape setup and your reader and your upload dates and you know all this other stuff. It's a lot. And this is the same for in-person auditions by the way. I think, again, it, with that process, you're looking at, okay, this is what I need to learn. This is what I need to leave my house to get to the place I need to go. I have to figure out what the parking situation, like, it, you know, there's logistics to all of this stuff that people need to figure out. We sort of recognize that those are important logistics and they certainly are worthy of space in your brain. But the deep dive script analysis cannot just be saved for when you are on set because the audition helps you get to set and doing the deep dive script analysis is what gives you confidence in your choices. It gives you layers to play with. It helps you find nuggets of information that may have otherwise sort of left you with a bit of a blank moment. It truly just gives you things to play. It helps you understand that you are in the tone of the world that we're looking for. And all of that stuff adds to the performance quality of your auditions, whether they are live or virtual. And they help us see how we can put you into our world. I think it's really like a reading comprehension thing when you boil it all down. And Erica and I have talked about this because when we started teaching classes more and more when the pandemic hit and we kind of developed all this stuff, we were finding ourselves giving the same notes over and over and over and over and over and over again. And we were like, what is missing? Like, what is the application that's really missing here? And what we were finding it was that it was an understanding of the text, an understanding of the scene. And I think before when people were going into the room live, 
there was almost a sense of, I'll ask when I get there. And when I get there, they'll redirect me and it'll be fine. I'll get all the answers to my questions. You can't do that in a salt team anymore. You have to answer those questions for yourself. But I always found also the performances I like best when we were doing things in the room are the people who did that work ahead of time, who figured that stuff out and made those choices and didn't need obscene clarity or miss this really obvious stuff once they got in the room. And yes, you know, there was redirecting, there was adjusting, there was all this, that kind of stuff. But when you're able to make those discoveries and do that homework, you are able to kind of effortlessly insert yourself into a performance. And the more we started harping on it and kind of figuring it out, the more people started asking us like, well, where do we take a script analysis class? And we were like, we, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> like, does that, does that exist? We were sort of finding that, but it was a skill that people were losing more, especially in the self-tape capacity. And we sort of taken it back to the very, very basics, I think. Yeah. It intimidated me almost at first because I will say I'm not someone who can like live in paperwork, which is probably astounding to a lot of people because like I'm productive, but in terms of creative, I'm like, it's off the page. It's like reaction and acting and I don't know, you know? And when I hear like paperwork, I think of, I think there's some acting schools that lean heavily on like, okay, you highlight these lines and you underscore these and comedy is written like this and all of those, like there's rules. So I was hesitant to look into script analysis because I thought I was going to be given like rules basically. But I actually found that I found more freedom and confidence in the thing that we're always told to do, which I hate this old sentence, but it's true, to make a choice because my choices were less broad. Like my character is not going to be 10,000 different things. She's going to be some mix of these few that are kind of presented with the scenario you're given. And so it gave me structure to build my chaos instead of just chaos with no structure. That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. Because that's the thing, right? Sort of a heady exercise, right? You are breaking down text. You're thinking about the text. You're digging into words. You're very much in your head, which is not how you act, right? You need to be in your body when you act. And so I think, you know, we have noticed too, that even in our classes, the moving from the text analysis exercises to the application exercises, there's often a, a disconnect because I think people tend to get in their head when they are breaking down the text itself. But the more you practice it, the more you can take all of this knowledge that you have just gained about this character and put it into your body and have that experience that you just talked about, Sam, where you are discovering things that fit that character, that fit that piece, that fit what the purpose of the scene is, that give you the confidence to know that you aren't just throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks, that you are actually somebody performing in a way that we could move into our world very seamlessly. And at the end of the day, an audition is an, an interview for that job, for that character, for that role. So it needs to fit that role. <laughs> it sounds so basic and ridiculous and obvious, but it's also like, I think actors, especially especially with self-taping, they're told to like, try stuff, to stand out, whatever. And it moves you so far away from your instincts. It moves you so far away from the things that you were taught to do. And script analysis, we hope, sort of brings actors back to that thing that they are taught to do to discover the character that lives within this world. That paperwork thing is so valid, too, because, like, it feels like like you're in class again. You're in school, right? And when, even when I say reading comprehension, your body goes, like, ugh, a little bit. Like, I don't want to I don't go back to, like, yeah, language I art. think of, like, the SAT. Yes, <laughs> but it is actually so related to this stuff. But it feels, like, anti-everything about what we love about being a performer, about, like, this freedom and expression and, and, mm -hmm. and performance and all of these qualities. And we're sort of saying, like, go back to the page, look at all of these things that are there for you to build the performance, that they actually live together and that these really successful performances will come. And you have a very basic understanding or a, or a very nuanced understanding, I guess, of what is actually happening on the page, not just zoning in and being like, what words do I need to memorize so that I can make this tape? And that's really what's been happening in the self-tape world because of deadlines and timing and everything else. It's like, okay, I got side lines, 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 lines. And then you're missing all of this stuff on there that like, had you just taken even 10 minutes to, to look through, you might have understood like, oh no, there's a huge joke in here that I didn't see. And like, yeah. what, what that means. I can take that one. <laughs> <laughs> we've all been there, Sam. We've all been there. Yeah. You know, watching your old auditions, if it, for anyone who didn't see that Instagram story that day, we worked on a piece of text 
that I had previously auditioned total coincidence. for. We had and no idea. By the end no of idea. total coincidence, total coincidence. And by the end of that work, I was taking a video making content because everything's content of myself in my living room doing it. And there was a moment where I just literally grabbed my face and leaned forward because the tone was there. And I'm sure it was like a fine tape, but the joke of that character was in the end of the piece. And I totally thought it meant something else. And I ran with my thing. And I also, I auditioned for both the roles that were in that scene. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to make them look different. And I got to make them like, what's their qualities that are different? And so I was so zoned on like getting it done and getting it turned in the next day that I focused on, and this is something I'd love to talk to you about. I tend to sometimes focus on how it looks versus what I'm doing. And I think this is something that a lot of my listeners feel too, is we're so focused on how we look on camera. There's a lot of pressure to like, look, oh, God forbid, I hate when the role is like, she's beautiful. It helps me none. It helps me too. none. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, like that is the, honestly, truly the absolute tragedy of self-taping is that you have to watch yourself. Yeah. It's terrible. I mean, we were just talking about it here. Like I was saying how I can't stand looking at myself through this camera. Like it's, it, it is hard. It's a very, very difficult thing. And, and actors, as actors, you're incredibly vulnerable, right? That's a big part of who actors are putting yourself out there. You're being very brave about doing it. And so of course you're going to be hypercritical <laughs> as you watch yourself. This is why, again, your script analysis is so, so key because if you're doing that work and you're mining out the information and you're finding the details and you're layering all that stuff and you're putting it into your body, you can easily get this stuff done in two takes for any given scene maybe three, but like you can do it. And so again, if you are limiting the number of takes and running a bit on instinct, you're going to save yourself the hassle of watching yourself and being like, wow, look at that hair. Look at that gray hair sticking straight up there. You will prevent yourself from going down the rabbit hole about dumb stuff or about a shadow or the, you know, this one drives me crazy when they're like, my dog barked for three seconds in the middle of the tape. Like, who cares? Who cares? You know, hopefully the script analysis stuff is what gives you confidence to be like, I know the character work is there and I'm going to just let it go and trust that that instinct I felt when I did take two and I was like, that was it. You're going to just run with that because you can get it done in that view. You did it in person. You do it on set. You don't need a million where you are then having to go through so many different takes staring at yourself and being hypercritical of everything about them. The styling is also something we talk about a lot because, you know, styling is important. I think as an actor, when you are styled a certain way and you feel like, you know, you've got the blazer on and you've got the heels on, like you carry yourself different. And that stuff is all really valid, but that's not what we are looking for in your tape. And I think there's this idea that like we have to be presented exactly like it's going to be dropped into this episode. And it's like, no, we hire wardrobe and makeup and all of these people and they're going to get you right. But if the essence of the character is not there we we can't change that and that is what we're looking for you don't have to trick us into anything to your point too like when you're auditioning for two roles and you're like i gotta make them different and like like almost like we would turn on the second one and be like oh, who is that person that couldn't possibly be the same actor like we're never it's, it's still you you know what i mean so you can bring your sensibility to both of those roles that's exactly what we're looking for and those roles in that one were pretty similar right like they're pretty similar essence and sensibility they're best friends essentially in the scene that we were talking about, but they have different goals and they have different discoveries within the scene. And that is what makes them different people. So it's really about honoring that and not trying to focus so hard on like, if when I'm in the black shirt, I am playing Sam. And when I'm in the white shirt, I am playing Alex. And that, and it's going to be so different that their minds are going to be blown. And like, yes, well, you have to code switch in your own brain, right? Like you've got a way to differentiate totally. them. And sometimes it's really hard, especially when you're reading to, it's an awful, awful trick we play on actors sometimes. But like how how you make that work and the visual is not going to be as important as the emotional because as casting directors that is the thing that we are zoned into we're zoned into that connection that's what we're looking for that essence that connection that responsibility of a person and that and how do you humanize something and how you make it work for the world that we are in that's the business that's the craft if we were just going off looks we wouldn't audition people we would just choose off the headshot which by the way for print auditions i still have to audition sometimes and i'm like 
I don't I don't understand that sure. world, how that works at all. So I can't <laughs> it's I can't so annoying. That. At least it's better now. At least I send in a quick tape. I used to drive to Santa Monica at four thirty PM and smile for two seconds and leave a room. So like small victories, I'll take it. <laughs> so if, if somebody has no context of what script analysis is, will you kind of give us an overview of what that means and kind of the categories that you guys like to lead actors into? Sure. It's sort of what Karen mentioned earlier, which is effectively reading comprehension. Again, just not the not sexy. cutest phrase to use. No, not cute. We'll rebrand it. I'll yeah. think of something. <laughs> I'll think of something. Yeah. Sexier. We need a sexier package. <laughs> We do. Something very exciting with an exclamation point, I think. But that's effectively what it is, which is that taking this piece of text and making sure that you understand the purpose of the scene, the purpose of your character in the scene, the arc of the story, the relationship between the characters and what maybe your character wants from the other person. Those are the kind of the overview things that you want to think about. Within those things, you're going to find all kinds of different actionable things that you can play, layers of emotion you can build off of. That's the yummy stuff. You know, when we're looking at auditions, what is really appealing about them is the humanity. And I think a lot of times when you are not doing text analysis, you read through something you're like, okay, I got it. I got the gist of what's going on here. I, I get it. I'm good. You, you end up being very surface, not intentionally, of course, but you are not digging into the other things going on that are going to give you so much more to play with as the actor. You can just discover all of these different emotions, feelings, vibes, whatever that you can draw on. And each take is going to be slightly different in subtle, interesting, nuanced ways. And that will keep it feeling good, fresh, appropriate to both you and the scene. There's so much there that you can really dig into. But Karen and I have developed our own little script analysis system. And we do have our own categories that we like to talk about when we are looking at any given piece of text. And again, because Erica and I there was no class for this. We really like, this came out of a need, out of a necessity of actors to be like, how do I learn this? And we were like, we don't know. And then we got really nerdy and like, we were trying to develop actually another class and we were talking about developing something else. And then through that, we're like, what if we like took this to this level and and literally just frantic texts back and forth while like standing in Target and like, <laughs> <laughs> like trying to figure this out. But so we sort of boiled it down to these six categories. Now you can't look this up in a book. This is not like like an approved methodology. This is literally just from the brains of myself and Erica. So our categories are goals, relationships, the project, the environment, the text, and character building. So there's six categories. And within those six categories, we like to ask a lot of just thought-provoking questions to encourage you to just look through the text and answer. So within the goals, what we sort of like to say is to start really objective with a wider lens and narrow in. Because again, as actors, you get sides and you go right to those lines that you have to memorize. And it sort of becomes a memorization contest instead of a performance because you're like, I just got to get my lines down. I got to get my lines down. But when you open it back up and you think of it objectively, the thing we like to start with is this is meant to be consumed by an audience. This is meant to be viewed at the end of the day. It's not about you. It's about somebody watching this and feeling something. So why is this scene here? Because if there's no purpose to this scene, it's going to be cut. And if that's the case, then what are we doing? And from the smallest co-star, this is true. Because anybody who's got two lines is there to establish something, establish an environment, establish a rhythm, move the story along, whatever it is. But why is this here objectively for the audience? What is the goal for the audience, somebody watching this? What are they supposed to feel? And then moving along to the goal of each character. And do those goals align? And if they don't align, how do you make sure that you're still getting the point across to the audience then if your goal as a performer, as the character doesn't align with the goal of the scene? You have to keep all of that in mind in order to tell this story. As an actor, that's your job. And so starting with something as basic as that, opening up objectively and then just sort of working inward, 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 all of a sudden you have, I think, information and objectivity that you were missing before when you're just like, I have to say the instead of those. I have to say the instead of those. I have to say the instead of those. And even in like, I think we can kind of dive into each of these because they're so juicy is like just reading a script 
without knowing the name of the character you're going to play because you instantly start focusing on those lines. Speaking as a actress who loves validation and attention, I will go to my character and I'm like, these are her lines and these are the best lines and they matter because and like not worrying about what and <laughs> you know, they <laughs> clearly are important. I'm not worrying about what another character does or says in response. And in the tiny nuances of like how they say it tells you about how they feel about your character. So being able to read that all and see it all as one and see it objectively before you see it subjectively as your character was so important to me. And what you said about there's a reason a co-star is there. I think in one of our classes, you said something to the effect of like, they're not paying you because for fun. They don't like to pay That's people. We've seen. They want to pay they you, like obviously. To money. They don't want to pay anyone. Exactly. <laughs> like they nope. aren't spending money for a good time. They aren't having more actors on set because they love new faces. This has a role and it has a purpose and they're paying you because you fulfill a purpose. And that was like so good to hear. When you read it, you're reading it like your character brain on. So you're looking for the tiny things that she's doing and she's doing. When Erica and I read scripts, we don't read them like that. When casting reads scripts, when producers read scripts, when network executives and studio executives and buyers, people with the money read scripts, they're not reading them that way. They are reading them as a whole and they're reading them as, do I want to watch this? It's really hard to sort of separate that as an actor because you immediately want to go to the work and get to the work and get down to the nitty gritty, but you miss so much when you just dive in that way. Erica and I read hundreds and hundreds of scripts a year, like no cap, hundreds of scripts a year. This is sort of second nature to us because of that, because the more you're reading and the more you're looking at words and the more you read things that aren't well written too, the more you can sort of pull out and see how structure works and how stories work and arcs and and you know, everything is everything and, and relies on one another to work. But it's sort of that diving into the work, which is instinctual and great and obvious. It's obvious why you guys would do that. But it also makes you miss that bigger picture sometimes. We always tell actors that like the audition space is all about you. It's just you. It's you in front of a blank wall, canvas, whatever. But the scene is not all about you. Even when you are the lead of the show or of the movie. The scene involves you and another person. Unless your character is looking into the mirror and talking to themselves, the scene is not all about you. There are more than one person in any given scene. What is the scene for? What is the relationship between these people? What do they want from each other? That's why your text analysis is really key because the audition space can be incredibly indulgent and rightly so, right? We always say to actors, like, the audition is your time, it's your space, it's your time. You know, we're always reminding actors of that. But that doesn't apply to what your character is experiencing. So I think if you can remember that when you're looking at, oh, my my character has the best lines, which I think is just the, the greatest statement. I mean, just so cute. <laughs> like, my character has the best lines. Like, that's great. But what is your character saying to the other person? And why are they saying it? And what are we doing here? And what is the relationship between these people? And that stuff is really, really important so that you aren't just in your own special little world grasping at, is this the right thing? All right. Well, that's one section of this. <laughs> Go on, Kara. <laughs> well, within each section, we have like numerous questions that we like to ask actors. And then eventually, as the exercises go on, we ask fewer questions in each section till eventually we're just leaving actors with the section. And we're saying, answer these questions for yourself. But within each group, I mean, the questions that we ask are just under the text section, which is literally just about the words and letters and symbols and things like that on the page. There's just so many questions that we're asking people to think about. Why does this punctuation here? Is there anything in the stage direction that feels meaningful? Is there anything in the stage direction that you can adapt for the audition space? We're saying, look at this stuff in a more global way and then decide how you want to take the information that you found and layer it. There's also like a lot of intention in things like punctuation or even character names or locations or or all of these things. And so if you just start to examine those things, what is the intention behind the punctuation? Why is this written in all caps? Does that mean you have to shout it? Nope. It doesn't, spoiler alert, it really doesn't, but it means it's said with intention and with an urgency, right? And maybe that's not shouting. You know, it's in the look that you give or it's in some other way. But if you focus on the intention of those things instead of the, the literalism of that, 
you are able to craft a performance that's more internal and more natural to who you are instead of sort of hitting the choreography of these certain marks on the page. And I think, again, actors are such good students and such people pleasers, and they just like want to want to check all the boxes and do all the right thing. So they're like, well, there's an ellipse here. So I'm going to take a beat there. And there's an M dash here. So I'm going to I'm going to cut there. And there's this comma here. So I'll take a little breath there. And it and it just becomes about hitting your mark instead of making it a complete three-dimensional human and we are so much more concerned with the humanity like we've sort of been saying before the other thing is by the time you guys we were talking about this yesterday yesterday what day is it by the time you guys get sides they're usually from extremely early drafts of these scripts because casting is the first one in the door sometimes before a director it and you guys are getting early, early drafts that haven't been through revisions yet. So there might be egregious errors in that draft or sentences that don't make any sense within that draft. And these auditioning actors still feel like they need to hit them exactly word perfectly as written, even though it makes absolutely no goddamn sense. And then somebody else just comes in and fixes it with their mouth. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's what it was supposed to sound like. Thank you. That person figured it out and worked it out. And so there's so many different levels to it, too, in terms of like, and that's part of the text is understanding what draft this is, looking up and saying, OK, I see this as a studio draft. There's not even a locked production draft yet that, you know, the network hasn't even chimed in with notes yet. And so what does that tell me about where we are in this journey with this episodic script or whatever it is? So there's just so many things that you can be looking at the page number is going to give you clues like everything on the page is a clue but often we miss that stuff because we just go to my line my line my line bullshit 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 my line my line my line my line (laughs) yeah no 100 percent. i think that's the next bullet point which is your text right i would assume from an actor who if i didn't take the class already i would have said oh yeah it's just it's the words and like the words denote like you know what kind of care i not actually looking at it and saying this is seen X, Y, and Z on page 37. What does that tell you? There's so much more information in it than you realize. And you also touched on something, Kara, that I definitely want to talk about is that you guys often get to cast really cool stuff. And there's like, it's been seen by a network or like a producer of things. A lot of our actors who are listening are self-submitting on projects that sometimes I'm unclear if anybody else read the draft. I'm like, this is a first round edit and you're, I don't know where you get your money to make things, but like, I'm so jealous that you can do it. But sometimes, you know, we're thrown stuff and it's like, oh, this is not, this didn't have 18 people weighing in on the sentences in this script. But knowing that this process also works on that is really interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like fixing dialogue and things like that, like taking some liberties Yeah, I mean, you want to be careful with that stuff, right? Because you want it to feel like you aren't simply changing dialogue. That can be a little bit of a red flag. But realistically, it is not uncommon, even in the bigger budget things that have a lot of people looking at every single draft, it's not uncommon to find a typo. And I think a lot of times actors in their wonderful rule follower sense look at those things and they're like, I have to say this doesn't feel right coming out of my mouth. I have to say it exactly when really it's just a typo. It's just a typo. So it's not so much about changing dialogue, including the dialogue that maybe isn't so great. It's really just being aware of things like that, that they exist in these drafts, in these audition drafts. That is not uncommon for for any type of project. The projects that don't have all of the different eyeballs going over all of the different drafts. I mean, listen, we've all read them. We've all seen them. We've all been asked to participate in them somehow. The, the best thing you can do if you are finding that you are your instinct is to change a lot of the dialogue is to pass on that audition. That is the best thing you can do because there is no telling that it's going to get better, that it is going to go through a revision process. There's absolutely no guarantee of that. So if you are feeling strongly that you would want to change a large amount of the dialogue in your audition scene, that's maybe not the project for you. And that's okay. That's okay. Not every project is for every person. I think too, like this idea of taking liberties feels a little like, oh, that feels like you're going to rewrite and do too much and go off on a tangent. And there are some projects that are going to invite you to ad lib and improv, usually in the comedy space. And like, obviously, if they give you that great, God have the best time. Those are some of my most favorite auditions. But it is about 
making the text work for you. And that's what it is at the end of the day. It's not about twisting yourself to be uncomfortable, to be what you think exactly they're looking for on the page and saying, well, I know they want this. I don't really do that, but I'll do it because they want it. And that's how I'm going to get hired. That's never going to work. But instead looking at what you have on the page and saying, okay, this is how I can bring myself to this. And if the words aren't quite making sense or maybe need to be flip flopped in order to make sense coming out of your mouth, then just make it work for yourself. You know what I mean? When I'm watching a great audition, I might not even notice that they skipped a sentence because the audition is so great until I've watched it five times and be like, oh yeah, they missed that moment, but I don't care because the audition is good. So all of these things that we harp about in self-tapes, a lot of them become forgivable when the work is great. We don't even notice because the work is so good. And I think that's what's important because this emphasis on having the perfect backdrop, having the perfect lighting, having the hair done perfectly, having the perfect wardrobe, having the perfect reader, having the perfect desk, all of that stuff can be forgiven when your work is just so effortless and you feel so plugged in and so dropped in and so conscious of your world and you have done all of this work, all of this building, you clarified these relationships, you understand where you're comfortable, you understand where in the story you're servicing, the genre, the type, the process, the purpose, and you're just letting it go with such ease that's the thing that we are going to respond to every single time. And that starts with the script on Alice. I once had a young woman in a class with me and I had her do a scene that I was very familiar with. It was a role that I'd actually cast. So I, by, by the time we were doing it in this class, I'd seen this hundreds of times between the real auditions and, and class exercises and things like that. And she sent in the tape and it was so good. It was so good. And we were playing it and we finished playing it. And I was just like cavelling over how good it was and the layers and the yummy. It was so good. And she's like, oh my God, I'm so relieved. I was so worried that you'd be upset about that line that I dropped. And I was like, what line? And she was like, I just decided to send you this take, even though I missed that line because I felt like it was my best take, but I was really worried that that was going to be a major issue. And like, this is a scene that I'm wildly familiar with and I did not yeah. notice. She had done the work. She had done the work and it came through beautifully. And of course, there are plenty of writers and producers and whatever out there who are more specific with their words. They want you to be more very on book. But for the most part, in my personal experience, the writer producers want to see good acting. That's what they get excited about. So it's not about so much about you changing things as they come up. It's just acknowledging what is there in the text and then forgiving yourself for any errors that you do and remembering that your performance is far more important than your word perfectness in your audition. And it feels as though we find that performance when we thoroughly understand what we're doing. Yeah, how could you, and how I could you not? <laughs> that's, uh, there's a heavy contingent of actors who, God bless them, have all the confidence in the world. And I'm jealous. I wish it was me. But they are so of the belief that I am such a good actor that everything else will be made to fit. And I'm go with God once, like you said, have fun with that. But I think the baseline of quality actors that are currently available for you to audition is so high that, yes, being an incredible actor, I feel like is like kind of our baseline now. And we need to be able to understand and puzzle that in with the role we are given. And I think where this really kind of falls apart is when we're often told that we are not auditioning for the role, we're auditioning for the room. Can you talk to that a little bit and kind of how to delineate between those two tried and true sayings? I mean, for me, that's a mindset thing. That is to help you understand that if you don't get this job, it's okay. That what you want to do is make an impression upon the casting director so that if you ultimately don't get this job for the millions of possible reasons that you might not get a job, that they will remember you for future things. It's not about foregoing the character at hand. You want to get that job. That's what you're trying to do with the audition, right? Like it's, it's not just an exercise and showing how good you are. That's what your materials are for. It really is that you want to do good work so that casting remembers you. That's the idea. If they don't book you for this job, they will ultimately remember you for the other job. So for me, that whole book the room, not the role thing is really just to sort of help actors process the endless 
amount of no's they hear in their life. Because I think that you can get a yes out of out of a given no when you think of it that way. But for me, the thing that makes an actor memorable is good mm. work. This is where actors go really wrong. And again, they move away from their natural instincts, from the things that they know how to do because they're trying to stand out in their self tapes. Yeah. And this is again, when you throw away all of your instincts, you throw away your script analysis and you just try something in order to stand out. And that is not gonna serve you. It's not gonna serve you, it's not gonna serve the role and it's not gonna work for the casting director. So if you want to ultimately do the thing of booking the room, having casting remember you, you need to do good work. And a big part of doing good work is doing your homework, doing your text analysis, mining out that information and then putting it into your character. To me, this book, the room thing goes hand in hand with this make a bold choice thing. I feel like they're two sides of the same coin because what it's telling actors is you have to be memorable, that it doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you go in and you stand out in some way. They're going to remember you. You're going to book the room. They're going to be like, oh my God, that tape was so what and whatever. But the problem with that is then you're no longer focusing on the task at hand and the work and the job you've literally been asked to interview for. You're just focused on doing something weird out of the box to stand out. And that's not why we remember. I mean, like we do remember people, but it's usually in a bad way <laughs> for that. And so that's really not booking the room. That's really what you're saying to us is I'm going to look past everything you've given me and all the givens and the script and the tone. And I'm just going to come in and do whatever I want to do. And it's going to be crazy and weird. I can't rely on you as an actor to come in and do a job then. It is a job interview. And we find that actors come in or self tape. There's so much pressure on it, right? And what they end up doing is throw their entire toolkit at a roll and say, here is what a multifaceted, incredibly Juilliard trained actor that you are going to be get for the role of cop number two if you hire me right now. But I don't need you to be all those things. I just need you to be cop number two. So if you can come in and confidently be you as cop number two and deliver, then I'm going to remember you even if you don't get the job and be like, oh, yeah, he, he did a great read. They ended up going with something else for 3,000 other reasons, but we should bring him back in or remember that guy. So this idea of like, make a bold choice, be memorable, stand out, book the room. I think the intentions are so good of that, right? Like it, it's the best of intentions of like trying to say, bring your A game and do your best, make a good effort. But I think the message gets lost in the mess because then you lose focus of what exactly it is that you're there to do as an actor and what the point of your audition is. Yeah. I wonder too if we sometimes confuse things we do in class, in like acting classes, with things we are bringing into the professional world and professional auditions. Because a lot of times in class, you'll do something wild. Like we're going to take a sitcom script and we're going to read it like a dramatic A24 movie or something like that, you know? And it's so fun and you watch people you know doing it. So you are already familiar with them. So it's interesting to you. But then when you see it, like you can't bring that to an audition. And I think sometimes the delineation between playing in class and like really being creative and fun can get a little lost in the presenting of your final tape. Not that I don't think you can be creative, but I think sometimes they're not always a cohesive mix. Well, auditioning is a different muscle. It's just a totally different muscle. And I think that's where it gets lost a little bit because there is acting and there's the craft and there is your toolkit and there's the play. And auditioning is a completely different category of that. And you get really good at auditioning. It's a totally different animal. And, and it's something that you have to sort of really focus into. And with this script analysis stuff that we keep harping on, that's why. Because you have to sort of take all these pieces and all the things you know that you're capable of and then find where that bell appropriately for this particular moment. I think it is, it's hard because you want to show what you're capable of. You're like, this is my chance to be in front of these really exciting people who could hire me for the future and have lots of money and are going to turn me into a star. And I want to show them that I can do a handstand. And we don't, again, we don't need you to do a handstand, ma'am. So it's really hard to sort of separate that in your brain when you when you just want to prove yourself and want to do it all. And especially as you get more and more auditions and don't book, or especially if the auditions are so few and far between, the pressure, I think, really reaches a boiling point of like, this is the one. And now I got to pull out all the stops for this one. And it, you know, it's really tough. I mean, the the number of auditions that I have seen where the actor is just so in the pocket, they're so connected, they're so present. 
I mean, they are breathtaking and they happen on every single project. It's not a one-off experience. I mean, it happens constantly, but when you see it, you think, oh, it is like, it's like a magician doing a trick in front of you. You can never figure out how they do it. Right. It's, it's, it's just, mm. it truly is a magical experience. But I think the actors, when you are, especially when you're dealing with self taping, you know, this happens too with in person stuff, of course, but with self taping, you're just so desperately in your head, especially if you've not seen any success yet from self taping. Mm -hmm. I know so many really wonderful, talented actors who were really saw plenty of success when, when auditions were largely in person and they've yet to see that same success virtually. And they just sort of put all of their instincts aside. They just try weird stuff, whatever. But the thing that they are trained to do, the thing that they know how to do, the thing that they do in person is the exact same kind of quality that we look for in a self tape, in a virtual read. We are looking for the depth of that character. We are looking for the depth of your connection. We are looking for that presence, all of that stuff. We don't need all of the tricks. We don't need shtick. We don't need any of that stuff. We don't need you to show us range in your two takes. We don't need any of that. We've got all of the materials. We've got your resume, your reel. We've got other uh, things that you've ever read for us on hand. We've got all of that stuff. We don't need it. We need you to connect to this character. And if you are just staying on the surface of who that character is and who they are to you and how you can find your way to them, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Perfectly fine. That's actually the, the bulk of the auditions we see are perfectly fine. They're not bad. They're, you know, when you hear the note, she did a good job. We just went another way. That is pretty typical. But the ones that really sort of move the needle are the ones that are deeply connected. They have found a way to bring themselves to this character. They found the way to bring the character to themselves. They are digging into the specifics of that character's experience and then letting go and seeing where it takes them. And I think that can be where the excitement is. That's where that person's take is different than, than the next, but mm -hmm. it's there. It's there on the page. We always say that the script is the blueprint. Your audition is a draft. What you do on set is I suppose technically a draft as well. And then they, they put it all together in post to make the finished product. Right. But the script is a blueprint. It's there for you. Use it for more than just the specific words, you know, think, use it for all of the the things underneath and behind and around and near those words. It's funny too, because I think like if some people listening to this might be like, I only audition for co-stars. How am I supposed to like deeply connect to wait? <laughs> you got it. You hit, you hit my next topic. <laughs> right. There. right? Yes, and please. like, that's legit, right? We're, we're talking about a whole lot of stuff too. We're like kind of skipping around talking about like series regulars and leads and supporting and blah, 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 blah. But like, they, it really does apply to everything because the way that you deeply connect to something like like waitress is by doing the script analysis and understanding the world, understanding the job competency, understanding the environment, understanding why that person is there, how they're moving the story along, how they feel about the patrons, what hour of their shift they're in, and how that all relates totally to the world around them. And when you can drop in effortlessly to something like that, when we just go, great, it makes sense. But sometimes then there are all these choices to try and stand out or make her angry waitress or make her jilted waitress or, you know, like, I guess it's the same thing as angry, but it's make her whatever that don't actually apply to all of these things we just talked about, the environment, the, the story, the move, the pace, the moving it along, the tone, that doesn't apply. So now you're taking things that don't belong and you're trying to fit square peg round hole. And so we need to figure out how to connect these worlds together. And that is you and your own lived experience, your body, your skin, your gender, your weight, your age, your, all of that stuff that makes you you. And then the blueprint that is the script, like Erica was just talking about, and how those two kind of blur effortlessly together and how you drop in with your own experience to all of these discoveries that you've made. And listen, you don't become an actor to be waitress. We know, we know, but those roles require good acting. If it's bad acting, they're going to cut it out. They're going to be mad that they spent the money, yeah, whatever, right? Like, again, these roles exist for a reason. So we're looking for good actors. We're looking for actors who are going to make it their own, given all of the givens. So that's what we're looking for in these kinds of roles. And Karen and I like to break down scenes like that in our script analysis classes, the little two-line roles, the one-line roles, whatever, because there's just an endless amount of information on that page that when you look at one line, you're like, got it, right? Like it's, it's not like it's not brain surgery, but you look at it and that's your initial instinct, but there is just a ton of information and we could take 30, 45 minutes breaking down doing script, our script analysis exercises 
on a one to two line roll because there's so much there there. So that's what you have to remember is that there, you know, you, there are little arcs. Somebody asked me this recently. There was like, there's no, there's no arc when the waitress just comes in and they say, can I start you something to drink? And I was like, does somebody answer? Like, is there, is it what, what happens after that? There is a little baby arc. It's not a humongous four page arc. It's not a whole episode arc or a whole season arc. But there's a little arc built in there. How do you feel before you address that table? How do you feel when you leave that table? There are things happening that you can pull out of there that are going to make it more interesting than just, oh, I got another waitress audition today. Okay. Where you're just kind of, you know, it's almost like you go through the motions and you're not enjoying the process. You can enjoy the process on those ones too. And that's the other side of that yeah. makeable choice thing. There's that throw it away thing, right? Where it's like, makeable choice, throw it away, be memorable, do nothing. And like, it's like the auditions you care the least about are the ones you're going to book. And I'm like, I don't know. Like we throw so many one liner type of advice at actors that I understand why everyone is so confused. So confused. Yes. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! I mean, the list is so long. Yeah, but it's the thing so is, long. Is it's that I should do a podcast about that at some point. <laughs> for sure, sure. But but we'll say is that the thing about those auditions is that it lies in between. It lies in between the makeable choice and the throw it away. Is that it? It actually is slap dab in the middle, where it's you are the bold choice in your love lived experience, and you're doing that without effortful quality trying to put all these hats on and all this extra sauce on top of it of being too memorable you understand your function you're rooted in the job competency you're rooted in establishing the world and moving the story along you're establishing a baseline for where our other characters exist and how normal or abnormal it is and then your lived experience within that brings it all together to show the audience where these other people are at the end of the day it's maybe totally forgettable but that's still the point is maybe to be forgettable right it's not to be the shakespearean waitress coming in and delivering for your so there's so much to keep in mind but again that stuff starts with the script analysis because when you understand where you are why you are who you are what the relationships are do you know these people is it awkward are you just doing your job how many tables do you have that helps put urgency into your body it puts stake into your process it puts purpose it shows the audience the goal and then we have all of these things where you can just go okay now i know what i'm doing and it makes sense for me to drop in here many 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 years ago we were casting an episode of a show and we had a waiter now the waiter had to come in and say can i start you something to drink that's it and this is back in the day where we had producer sessions we had producers in the room we read eight actors for this one line role and they all just biffed it in their own way, in all different ways. Some people, like, like there was something about that line, can I start with something to drink that just kind of got stuck in some people's mouths. Some people just made very big choices. Some people were very flat, you know, whatever, there was just nothing. And at the end of that producer session, as we were talking about all the roles, one of our producers was like, you couldn't find an actor to play a waiter. Like he was like, what is up, y'all? You're just like, well, come on. But that's, that is so typical. It's so typical, right? Because again, you're thinking about how can I make this interesting or how can I make sure that it's not about me? And it's in between those things. You know, a lot of times when actors go out for co-stars, they sort of think of the worst possible version of that. So they think of the worst waiter that they've ever encountered. Or I always love when actors have to play actors, right? Like you're playing an actor in an acting class. You're going to play the worst actor that you know. Just <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, they're always because the, I think literally it's fun. the worst. Yeah. Yeah. I probably because I think it's fun. It's maybe also a little bit cathartic. But like, does the scene call for that? Are they annoying actor <laughs> are they angry waiter like no they're not what are they there to do and if you can understand the function of your character in that space and then do a little extra digging to think about how you want to bring your lived experience your point of view to that thing that makes it interesting it makes it human it makes us want to watch it it makes us want to say hey remember that paramedic number two let's bring them back again they were really good that's the kind of thing that really works and you have to trust that good work is the thing we remember always mm -hmm. that is what we remember it's not how you styled yourself it's not the color of your backdrop it's not that you had gorgeous three-point lighting it's none of that stuff it's the work it's the work we're hiring to be an actor at the end of the day so I'm just like going to sit back and I'm, t I'm I'm in class right now. I'm just taking it. <laughs> I love it. I can do this all day long. As we wrap up, I would love to speak to our actors who we just got our deal points from the new contract. 
most of us haven't auditioned theatrically. Maybe a couple people here and there for something with an interim agreement. If you got one of those, God bless, you got lucky. There's been like, it's been radio silent. You know, we've been doing a lot of commercials and things like that, but there is a lot of actors who feel a little rusty, who feel a little stagnant, who feel nervous in general. Can we just speak to these people? And also this episode is going to play in December. So we're also about to hit a holiday break that a lot of people feel as though they have not earned, quote unquote. So can we just speak to that audience in this time period right now? I mean, if you haven't earned a break after a global pandemic and a historic double strike, I don't know, what do you need to do to earn that break, right? Like, you earned it. (laughs) Take a goddamn break. But no, I think realistically, it is totally normal to feel anxious, nervous. For me, it's anxiety. Like, I felt it too. The moment they called the strike, I was like, ah, they called it. And I was like, what am I going to work? Like, it was just like instant. And so, so it's totally normal, right? We've been through two major, hopefully once in a lifetime events in the last three years, right? It's a lot. It is a lot. So I think the best thing you can do for yourself is just acknowledge your feelings, right? Give yourself the grace of being like, I feel anxious. I feel nervous. I feel worried. I feel left behind. I feel left out, whatever. And that's normal. There are gazillions of other people who feel the exact same way as you. So I think the best thing you can do, first of all, acknowledge your feelings and know that it's okay to feel the way, however you want to feel, whether it's jubilant and excited, or if it's excited and with a healthy dose of anxiety, whatever, it doesn't matter. But the best thing you can do is just put one foot in front of the other to keep yourself moving forward. So if that means just starting up your self tape practice at home again, starting to read some scripts again, starting to get back into class or coach or whatever you want to do. I think dumping yourself into the deep end is tough, right? Like we just went through this major event again. So instead of just like being like, I'll, I'll do my, get myself tape stuff out as soon as I get an audition. Like that's, that's a lot to put on that audition. That is a lot of stress to put on that audition. So again, baby steps, one thing at a time. Start by checking in with your reps. Send them a text, send them an email, be like, hey, what do you need from me? What are we looking at? Tell me things and then I will go to work and do my homework and come back and we can talk about goals and things like that for 2020. Little things are going to help you sort of move slowly back into this pool. Listen, we got time. The things that are going to happen in 2023 are the things that were already happening. It was the existing shows. It's anything that paused during the strikes. That is what they're focusing on in 2023. Anything new is likely going to be punted to 2024 for all of the obvious budgetary reasons around shutting down for holidays, right? So there's a limited amount of things that is going to shoot this calendar year anyway. So understand that it's not opening up the spigot and it's just a, you know, fire hydrants gush worth of stuff happening. It's a little bit. So you do a little bit. And you do whatever you have space for. And if you want to take a break to be with your family on Thanksgiving, or you want to take a break and take a trip for the holidays, do it. Now is the time. I I would hope that if we learn nothing from 2020, it's that like we should prioritize our lives over our jobs. That should be the thing that we're doing. Let's focus on the thing that makes us human. And for artists, I think that's really important. The things that make you human are the things that make you an interesting artist or the things that give your art meaning. That's what's the gold that you draw from emotionally. So take your time and give yourself some space and do whatever you need to do, you know, with your meditation or your therapy or your Christmas cookies or whatever, you know, just give yourself the space to sort of move slowly back into things because the industry is going to be moving I mean, it's fast for the things that are that were existing and going back into production. But for the rest of us, it's it's sort of a little bit more waiting. And that's okay. I'm coming at Erica's TED Talk. That's beautiful. I know, can, you tell I'm at, can you tell I go to therapy? And I know, it's <laughs> yeah, sure. I was, for sure. It's so funny <laughs> because I was saying to Erica the other day, the second the strike was called, my email inbox was oh my God. flooded with actors. Flooded. I got so many emails. Now that the strike is over, I just wanted to update you on my materials and my, and I signed a new agent. And I'm literally like, I got, I got like a hundred of these emails all of a sudden. And I was so, I was like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And it was like, it was like the hustle culture that we live in 
tells you that like, you got to go, you got to move, like everybody's doing it. I got to get in there too. And it was just sort of like the floodgates had opened and all of these things that people had been sitting on. They were like, okay, now I can, now I can push send. I was overwhelmed because I was like, I don't, I don't know what you expect me to do with all of these emails. And like, like Erica said, it is not a deluge of work that is all of a sudden happening. Strike called millions of people back to work. Like it is, it is a, okay, the strike is over. Now where do you go from here? And there is a lot of stuff in this new contract that still needs to be sorted out. We are still all figuring it out. And it's, it's, you know, there's some stuff in there that I think is great. And there is some stuff in there that I'm like, I have questions about. And I, and I think we all have questions about it. And I don't think it necessarily means that it's bad, but the internet is a cesspool. People are reactionary. The comment sections of things are absolute garbage and we get inundated so quickly. And because of that, we always feel like we're behind. We always feel like somebody else is doing something that we're supposed to do and that we're supposed to level up and that we're not meeting up. And this whole comparison is the thief of joy. It takes the winds out of your sails. And so Erica and I really always stress community above all things. And I know you have a fabulous acting community, Sam, as well. But things like that are what is going to ground you. Things like that. Having support of people who understand you and your artistic point of view and your personal struggle, because everybody's journey is so different. That's going to be the thing that has kept us together through this last ridiculous year, because there is a lot to sort out still. There is a lot to come and we are going to have to slowly navigate this all together. It's not suddenly one day all the auditions show up again and you, and everything is the same as before. It's like COVID too. Everything was different and we adapted. We're going to have to adapt again. Things are still changing. Technology is still changing. Studios are changing. Budgets are changing. Tons of series have been canceled. Actors have moved to different markets. There has been so much change and everybody has to stop and sort of figure out how that affects each other because it's a symbiotic relationship. So, you know, like Erica said, in just knowing that that's okay and accepting that and finding ways to fill your own cup and understanding that your mental health comes first if you need to turn off those comment sections is really good. But being able to rely on your community is, I think, going to be key for people in this in this next phase of the ramp up. Yeah, it's the same thing it was in the pandemic. It feels very similar as like, find your people and hold hands because nothing. It's also never the end. We're always going to experience like the next up and down. I think the hardest thing with the strike is that you went from like all of us together to now you're competing against each other for roles. That is hard. That's why your community really is so key because your community is filled with all kinds of people, right? Not just people who are auditioning for the same things as you. And if there's those people in there too, cool. You have stuff you can talk about. But I think there was an immense community this summer where everybody literally locked arms and we're like, we're together, we're one. And now it's like, I'm working or that person's working and I'm not, right? Like it, it becomes mm-hmm. sort of us against each other, even if we don't mean it that way. And that blows. <laughs> so yeah. if we can hold fast to the same idea of that community that we saw this summer, that we are there for each other, we're supporting each other, we're helping each other. Somebody needs a hand. We're going to help each other out. And that's truly, as Kara mentioned, that's that's your community. That's your people. That's that's where you yeah. find that stuff. When what I love about your guys' existence too on the internet is that it's not just – our communities are no longer just – all the actors – can be in a community and all the, you know, I talk to you guys both on social media all the time and it's not like, cause I'm trying to like float a job or something. It's because we're all in the world of like this actor online space. And, you know, there's like, there's so much more to community and it also helps with the mental power structure that we sometimes create in this job of actors are here and then casting is here and agents are here and managers are here and and producers are here and directors are here. And it's like, we're actually all just trying to get by and all trying to finish our day of work and sit on our couch with our beverage of choice, with our person of choice. Once we start to realize that and we're all in it together, it just takes off of that pressure of like, everyone's against me and I just got to fight my ranks. It's like, you know, community over competition. Always. And again, like there are things that, you know, somebody's going to swear by. I did this and it was great. I took this class and it was great. I went to this studio and it was great. I coached with this person and that was great. That's great. That works for that person. 
You know what I mean? You can try, you can sample, you can do all the things that you have to do. I'm, Eric and I offer fabulous classes that we think are great. They're not everybody's cup. We are not everybody's cup of tea and that's fine. But you also need to be paying attention to what you feel like is servicing you and your heart, not doing something because that's what everybody else is doing. And I think that happens a lot of time in times like these where it's like, well, what are they doing? What are they doing? They seem to be working all the time. I, I just got to get whatever she's got and and figure that out. I want whatever he's smoking and I'm going to succeed. So figuring out what works for you is just so important. Speaking of your classes, when this episode comes out, you guys were kind enough to gift me with a spot in your next script analysis class, which I'm doing in my 12 days of giving for Christmas. And I'm so excited about that. If that spot does not go to someone who's listening to this podcast, are there spots open in your upcoming script analysis class still? There are currently some spots open now. They can always check okay. the website and see what's open at all. You, I would assume we might have a couple spots left. There's usually like a bad dash at the end to fill the last like two spots we always find. But currently at stands, there are still multiple seats left in that class. And Karen and I always, we rerun classes and we always like to tell actors that if you want to come and exercise with us again in a class that has the same syllabus as before, we're always going to change up the material so that you are exercising with different material. You'll hear the same techniques and stuff like that reiterated, but you're not going to be working on the same material. And then what other things do you have planned for next year? Are you guys going to continue to do the slate you're working on? Is there other classes? I know you guys did $10 classes a lot through the strike. What's the plan for 2024? That $10 class with Erica's brainchild. She's so smart and so pretty and so wonderful to like give the gift of these classes to the actors during the strike. I just jumped on that train and let her chew, chew. Okay. So that was <laughs> all her. But now that the strike is over, those are done. We do have another co-star class coming up in January. There are still seats open for that. And then we're trying to figure out how to fit it all in, you know, because things are so unknown there to us too. And we are casting directors first. We do these classes because truly we love teaching and we love that we get to do this and and more so love that we are because it, it's not obvious to everybody out there. We love each other very, very much. But we also want to make sure that the quality of what you're getting when you take a class with us is significant. Like we we are not about like sign up and get seen and get a good job thing. Bye. Anybody that's ever taken class with us knows that. So there'll definitely be stuff. We're still we're still working on what that is. But if you follow us on social media, we always post about all of our offerings on there. And we wanted awesome. to make sure, you know, with this new contract coming out that we are aligning the things that we teach that you're actually going to be actively doing as actors. So we wanted to see, you know, what were the new guidelines around self-taping? Is there going to be more virtual stuff going on? So, you know, we will adjust our syllabi or make sure that the classes that we have available are going to be the most meaningful and impactful to actors as they are moving into life with this new contract and whatever comes with it. So we'll see. But right now we've got stuff for January. We will probably find ways to add things in for February, March, and then we'll just see where things go from there. But we are really always trying to update our syllabus and make it as useful as possible. We teach audition techniques, so we want it to be worthy of the kind of auditions you are experiencing in your daily life. So that's really key. And also, if you guys have a class out there that you're like, I'm dying to take a class like this, why don't you teach something like this? Reach out to us. We developed this one out of thin air, out of me, literally. Our script analysis class totally. came out of people over and over again being like, will you teach us? Will you teach us? And we were like, we don't know how. Then guess what? We figured out <laughs> how because we're a Maya Wang. So if there is something out there and there is a need, like, let's talk about it. Let's figure it out because we want to make sure that you guys have information, have the tools to be successful. I think there is this idea, like you were talking about, Sam, that like casting is here, actors are here, and the two shall not meet, and they're hiding things from you. We don't want to hide anything from you. There are there are certain things sometimes that we can't tell you because of NDAs and rules, and blah, 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 blah. We're not keeping things from you on purpose. We want you guys to all be on the same page and have all the information. Sometimes we assume that you guys have that information like script analysis. We assume that you have done that work and so we're not spoon feeding it to you. But then we realized, oh no, we need to backtrack and make sure that these things are evident, which is which is you know how this all got started. So we are always, always open to new ideas too. The OSHA Amazing. class was 100% born out of an actor who was like, I love learning with you. And I was like, cool, what do you want to learn? And they told me and that's where the OSHA class came from. So- they, we're, we're Wait, what's the oh shit class? 
The oh shit class so is, good. um, we were then auditioning for roles where when you get the audition, you say, oh shit. There are things like <laughs> heavy action scenes, scenes with intimacy in them, things that involve screaming, major, huge, heavy monologues with 24 hour turnarounds. They're the things that make you go, oh shit, when you get it. So. Yes. Oh, fun. <laughs> okay. I might have to take that yeah. one. <laughs> oh, you guys, I could talk to you all day. I'm also watching your business class in my other screen right now from yesterday. So I have a lot of, <laughs> it's like a lot of the two of you in my life right now. <laughs> We're just yes, hanging out. Not, it's great. <laughs> just hanging out. I will link all of your stuff in the show notes so everyone can follow you. If they are not, I'm sure they are. And thank you guys so much for this time. I really, really appreciate it. I'm glad I could snag you because I have a feeling you're going to be busy next year. That's just my prediction. Oh, from your mouth. Well, but thank you for having yeah. us. And, you know, we know that we absolutely love the stuff that you put out there. I think thank you. you're doing you're doing God's will. So thank you so much for all that you do. Thanks for having totally. me. Totally. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, guys.